Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, she sets up our slides, I want to do two things because of the fact that I recognize that this is the last talk of the last session of this conference. Um, so I want to, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to promise to end on time. Uh, but I also want to invite you all to just for a brief moment, stand up where you're at, if, if you're willing. Maybe stretch a little bit, because I want to make sure, because I know what it feels like to be sitting in the seat <laughs> for several hours. Uh, and, and I want to make sure that you all are refreshed a little bit. Thank you for <laughs> humoring me. Uh, you, may, you may sit as well, or you may continue to stand if you prefer, actually. Uh, just maybe off to the side. But, um, so I am delighted that I get to follow Rodrigo and Alex in this session because of the fact that I think it's a great, it's been a great setup. I don't think we planned this exactly, but it was great to start off in this session learning about our history and then followed up by a great uh, conversation by Rodrigo about ethics. So I want to follow that up, of course, by talking about how we can create a more just society through research. And I'm going to start off by explaining first what I don't mean before I get into what I do mean by that. So uh, I am not talking about research, specific research topics or specific research disciplines. I'm not trying to say, oh, we need to create a more just society by focusing on these types of research necessarily. Um, and I'm, not, I'm also not talking about um, you know, research uh, problems like having to deal with uh, human subjects, um, those kinds of, of challenges that, that, of course, are real, that we have a long history about and still exist. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Instead, what I am talking about is the research process itself. I, I am going to preface uh, this talk by saying, of course, you all know I am an academic, and I am an academic researcher, and I love the academy, but I am also extremely critical of it. And that's what I want to talk about today. So we have a long history, and by we, I'm, I'm mostly referring to academic researchers. We have a long history history of primarily focusing on doing research by the elite and for the elite. And that is, that is not something just of the past. This is, this is very present, very, very real. And the reason why this is a big concern for me is uh, because of how I came to be an academic. So let me share a little bit, if you'll bear with me, I want to share a little bit of my own academic journey and how I came to be an academic researcher and why it is that I am so critical of the academic research process. So I uh, grew up in Laredo, Texas. If any of you all are familiar with the border region, anybody here? Maybe you've been there? Good. Uh, so I'm from Laredo. My family's from Mexico, and I grew up on the Mexico-Texas border uh, in a very uh, poor area and in a very poor family. Uh, so my, my mother had an eighth grade education, and my father had a third grade education. And for us, needless to say, uh, things were very, very tough at home. And at a very, very young age, I saw firsthand many, many injustices. So nobody had to teach me about these things. I saw them early on. I did not have the terminology for it, as I do now as a sociologist, but I certainly knew what it was. And I saw many, many people in my community, and especially in my own family, who worked extremely hard for next to nothing. In fact, my first observation was pretty much that the hardest working people get paid the least. And they have 
no benefits and they have no control over their schedule. People like my own mother, right, who never had uh, paid time off, who never had a vacation, who often work double shifts, and so on and so forth. And, and like I said, especially never had control over her own schedule, and then was criticized for not showing up to her children's educational activities, right? Criticized for not having an interest in her children's education because she didn't show up. The reason why I'm mentioning all these things is background to explain why I ended up becoming a sociologist and why I ended up becoming a researcher of societal problems because I had all that background and yet through a series of miracles, and I, and I don't use that word lightly, through a series of miracles I had the opportunity not only to go to college but to attend some of our nation's most elite institutions that are at the cutting edge of research and I became a researcher as a result of that training. So I went to Stanford as an undergrad and then to Harvard as a graduate student and I was trained by some of the nation's best researchers and did everything that I was taught to do as a researcher. I'm mentioning all these things, by the way, not just because I'm showing off, but because I'm explaining that in our nation's, you know, supposedly top research institutions, this is how we train people to do research, right? And I'm going to get, go into the research model in a, in a moment, but I have to preface it why I'm, why I'm so critical of the academic research model, because this is how I was trained. And then, after going through all that, be, became a professor, also at one of our nation's top research institutions, did everything I was told to do, checked all the boxes in order to become a, a tenured professor, be promoted with tenure. And at that moment, paused and reflected on all the research that I had produced up until then through graduate school and as an assistant professor and realized that if I was completely honest with myself, I could point to nothing that had changed as a result of all that research. Nothing. And I'm being completely honest. Millions of dollars spent wasn't a complete waste of time because I learned through, <laughs> through that experience. I learned how to do research. But if I were completely honest with myself, I could point to nothing that had changed as a result of the, all the research that I had produced up until that point. So that is why I am very critical of the academic research model. There's so much potential though. There is so much potential. So it's not worth throwing out completely, but it's definitely worth reconsidering. If we are in fact interested, genuinely interested in creating a more just society, and I do believe genuinely that research can and should play an important role in doing that. So, what is this academic research model that I am referring to? And I think many of you in this room will recognize it. It's probably similar to how uh, many of you were trained. If I were to summarize it, it looks like this. The, the, what I'm referring to as the traditional academic research model, where you, as the researcher, be, through your expertise and through your knowledge of the research literature, you develop your research question or questions. You choose a research site. Uh, for those of us, especially those of us that do social science research, but for other uh, categories of research as well, you choose your research site based on those questions, ideally. Obviously, we, all, we will all admit that sometimes we choose them out of convenience, uh, but ideally, we're supposed to choose the research sites based on those questions. Then, uh, we develop short-term collaborations with those with, uh, from whom we will uh, collect data, right? And, and so in my case, because I am a sociologist of education, I, would, I was trained to go out and develop relationships with schools or school districts 
and then uh, develop a short-term collaboration, go in, collect the data, and then go on, move on to the next project, right? And finally, I was trained to focus on informing other academics through, of course, academic publications, right? This is the process of, of, of collecting data, analyzing, and then disseminating information that we learn through the research process. At best, if, we, if the point of research is to have an impact and to create a more just society, if we follow this academic research model, at best, it is a highly inefficient model. The time that it takes to produce that research, and especially the time that it takes to disseminate that information, is ridiculously long. That whole process, frankly, is quite outdated if we really think about it. But it's a very, very long process so that by the time the people that could actually benefit from that knowledge, that could benefit from that research, that could potentially put it to use, by the time that they get access to that research, it is outdated. That's what I kept hearing when I started talking to school district partners. Like, if you, you mean you want me to wait till this is published? And how long did you say that process takes? If you're lucky, if you, if you get your work published on your first try, which doesn't maybe some, for some of you maybe that's normal, but for me that's certainly not normal. So it usually takes a rather long time. And so I kept hearing from people, no, this is, this is not usable, this is um, outdated. And then I would hear further, actually we don't even have access to academic journals. And then even if we did have access to academic journals, they're not written for us. They're written for other academics. So this process, and like I said, I was trained at some of the nation's most elite these institutions, research institutions. This is considered, this is the state of the academy, right? And this process, at best, is inefficient. At worst, it's entirely ineffective. If the goal is for our research to actually inform our society in a meaningful and impactful way, and if we want it to be used to actually create a more just society. That's why I'm very critical of the academy. I love it. That's why I'm criticizing it. So over the last uh, decade, uh, we've been developing what we refer to as a partnership research model that looks more like this. And I don't want to, please don't misinterpret, please don't misunderstand, I don't want to present this to mean, oh, this is it, this, we've arrived, this is the answer. It's not. But I think it's an improvement, and we've been developing it over the years, we've been learning from many, many mistakes over the years, and I'm going to share some of those mistakes in a moment. Um, these are things that maybe a few years ago I would have been too shy to share, <laughs> too embarrassed to share, but I think it's important to to talk about our mistakes publicly and openly and to do that more often, both for the purpose of in encouraging others who perhaps have also made some serious mistakes and uh, letting them know that it's okay, we all do that, but also so that we learn from them. Um, so I'm going to do that in a moment. But what I will say about this partnership research model is I want you to notice that not only is it quite different from the more traditional academic research model, it is the opposite of the more traditional academic research model. Again, at least the way I was taught as a social scientist. So instead of the researcher developing their own research questions based on the research literature, um, the, in a partnership research model, these questions are jointly developed with community partners who may or may not know anything about research, may or may not have a research background, but are invested in the community and want to make sure that the research that we're producing is actually relevant to the problems and the challenges and the concerns that they are facing. That is extremely powerful information, extremely important information that we as researchers should not ignore. Right? That, is, that is very important. So, 
So we focus on jointly developed research questions. Our entire research agenda is jointly developed. And let me be clear, um, this is not for all researchers. I have been criticized many times uh, for, this, for using this research model. And some academics say, this is not for me. I went through crap in order, for many, many years in order to get a PhD so that I can call the shots, so that I can decide what to do research on, right? That, and I get that, right? You, it's like there's a sense of like, autonomy here, independence. That's why you get a PhD, so that you can have some of that autonomy. However, what I'm saying here is you need to give up some of that autonomy and not produce your independent you know, research agenda without consideration of what our community actually needs and wants and wants to use. Second, when I said earlier, site is typically based on the questions. Here it's the reverse. The questions are actually based on the site. The idea here is to focus on our community, our specific site, and design questions based on what is going on right here in our own backyard right now. So then the, the questions are developed accordingly. And instead of a short-term collaboration, just project-based collaborations, I mean, think about it. We're, ultimately, we're just using people. <laughs> we're just using people. We just collaborate with them to get the information that we need, and then we move on to the next project. That is really how I was trained. I am not exaggerating, right? Instead, the idea here is to develop long-term collaborations that are not project-based. We're not, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that we're going to actually solve problems through a single research study, but we're in it for the long haul to solve problems. So no short-term collaborations. Long, we like to say we're not dating, we're getting married, we're making a long-term commitment here with our community partners in order to solve problems. And last but not least, instead of focusing only on informing other academics, the goal here is to focus on informing our broader community, especially decision makers in our community that have influence over what, what is going on in our society, and to really focus on informing them in a manner that is accessible to them both literally accessible, but also in terms of how we produce our research products. Typically, they are not accessible to uh, many, many uh, people in our community. So that is um, the model that we've been applying over the last decade. And some of the things that I've learned in, by talking to a variety of community members that want to use research is that there are Three main, there are really more, um, but there are three main types of research use that we as researchers should be very aware of um, and that should inform how we produce research and how we uh, share research with others. So the first thing to, that we have to acknowledge is that there are a lot of organizations and a lot of um, er, uh, people in our community that do not use research partly because of the reasons that I mentioned earlier, just not having access uh, to research. But there are also many in our community that don't use research because they just don't trust it. They, there is no trust. And there are actually, I know a lot of times I hear conversations on campus by academics that look down upon people that don't trust research and those stupid people, those, those ignorant people that don't, that don't use research, they don't trust it, and how could, how, how, how could they believe all these false you know, uh, ideas that are out there, they should just listen to research? Well, the reality is that because of the way we academics have been doing research, as I said earlier, it's primarily by the elite, for the elite, of course people that are not considered to be elite, of course they're not going to trust us. They're not going, there is no trust. So it's perfectly understandable why uh, many people would not use research, even if they were to have access to it, if there is no trust. Um, so we just, I'm just using that as like listening to your gut approach, uh, that, that there, there's no uh, research use. And there are a lot, of, a lot of organizations and individuals that are in this category. Then there is uh, symbolic research use. And this is probably, 
Of those that do use research, I would say this is probably the most common use of research. That is that uh, people first decide what they believe, then they look for research that supports that belief, and that's what they use. And they conveniently ignore any research that, that contradicts that belief. This is a very, very common use of research that we as researchers, I know um, if we're aware of it, we hate it, it's like nails on the chalkboard, but if you go back and think about all the things that I just said about how we do research, this is an understandable approach as well. So if we as researchers want to encourage people to instead um, have a more instrumental use of research, which I'm describing as actually engaging with research, or better yet, engaging with researchers to uh, develop a research agenda and develop a plan for how to use it and then do, do so. Um, obviously, this is ideal, but if you stop and think about it, in order to encourage that type of research use, a lot of the burden is on us as researchers to make sure that the work that we are doing is actually reaching out. We're the ones that are in positions of power. We're the ones that have all this training. We're the ones that have all these resources. We are the ones that are in a position of power. Therefore, we should use that power in order to reach out into our community and make our work as accessible to them as possible and as beneficial to them as possible. And I have to say that my experience so far as an academic researcher is that this does not happen often enough. There are some of us that are doing this. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, I'm the only one doing this. No, absolutely not. There are a lot of people doing this and they're trying to learn how to do this better, but I, I don't think that enough of us are doing this, and I don't think that the academy in general, so I'm not just talking about Rice University here, I'm talking about the academy as a whole, is not embracing this enough. It's time for us to actually consider changing our research model so that we can actually make a very explicit effort to create a more just society. So I want to go back to this issue of trust. I, base, I, I mentioned trust earlier, and I said that one of the things that we've been learning is that when and if people do use research, it is based on trust. Notice it is not based on the rigor of the research. It is not based on where that research was published. It's not based on you know, the prestige of the academic journal or the prestige of the publisher. It is not based on any of those things. These are all the things that we as academics are taught to value, but the reality is that the people that actually use research, that, those are not the things that they look for. What they look for is trust. Do, can I trust the researchers that produce this work? Do these researchers actually know my community? Do they actually care about my community? I mentioned uh, earlier that I was going to share one of, an example of one of my mistakes, I, and to be clear, I've made many, but this was a big one, and one of the first mistakes that I made um, when, uh, close to the beginning of when I founded HERC, the Houston Education Research Consortium, which is a partnership uh, between Rice and now 11 Houston area school districts. So I wanted to make the case that we, this partnership was needed and so I uh, spoke at a board meeting, so a, a, a school district board meeting, <laughs> and uh, explained in great detail everything that was wrong with their research. So I was telling them basically why they needed to partner with us because their research, and, and, of, and yes, there were, there were serious problems with their research, but naive me, thought that that was the way to, to share what was, you know, what was wrong with their research and that that was the way to make the case that they needed to partner with us. As a result, and by the way, this is a photo of me speaking at a board meeting, but it's not that particular instance. <laughs> this is, this is I'm just using this to illustrate uh, this, but it's not that, that instance. But I later found out that as a result of the stupid things that I said, 
and the, and the stupid way in which I said those things at that board meeting. Naive, naive. What? Naive. Naive, okay, naive. Not, perhaps not stupid, but naive. Um, that I actually put uh, someone's job at risk. And this was the very person that was working to help me, to help me develop this partnership. So at that point, I had a decision to make, which is, you know, I could decide to just say, I can't work with these people if they're not willing to listen to me because I know so much about how to do research, or instead go the opposite direction and, and to have some humility and say, I was wrong, I should not have said those things, can you please help me? And that's the approach that I took. Um, a lot of crying was involved, a lot of apologizing was involved because I, I did put this person's job at risk. By the way, we're still good friends to this day. Um, but she said, yes, I will help you. And through her, I learned a lot about how districts work, how districts can use research if, if approached in the, in the correct manner. And that's always one of like, always sharing results, research results, especially disappointing research results in a constructive manner, not a finger pointing kind of manner. They're sick of that, everybody does that, right? So I learned how to communicate these things through insiders, right? Through people that were actually working at the school district. One of the things that I have learned about how you know if there is trust in those relationships um, as researchers is that the actual, the questions, the research questions, I said earlier, all our research questions are jointly developed. The types of questions that are asked by our partners have evolved over time in a significant way. So early on in our partnership, some you know, 10 or so years ago, most of the questions were what, what we would call program evaluation. Does program X work? And how does it work? And when does it work? And those kinds of questions. And those are useful questions, don't get me wrong. A program evaluation is very important. It's very important, it's very useful. However, those are questions that I would say they're, they're kind of down here at a kind of a superficial level. Um, but instead, now uh, that we have developed relationships of trust, our partners are asking harder questions, deeper questions, questions that are ulti ultimately about systemic change. These are, these are questions that, um, honestly, these are very dangerous questions for our district partners to be asking. Think about it. Asking a question like this, how equitable are we? How equitable are we by race and ethnicity, by gender, by economic status, by English learner status? Are there inequities across the district in terms of financial resources, in terms of human capital, like access to effective teachers and administrators? Are there inequities in terms of course offerings, advanced courses in particular that tend to be associated with going to college? Are there inequities in the availability of technology, inequities in our facilities, inequities in the, the COVID-19 resources that we're providing, and so on? Like, so this is the question that we got from one of our district partners just a couple of years ago. There's no way that they would have asked such a question years earlier before there was trust. Because this question, as I said, is a dangerous question. They are putting themselves at risk of all kinds of backlash. They are exposing themselves, putting themselves in, in a potentially vulnerable position by asking this question. But because we have developed now over a decade, developed a relationship of trust, I think that is why they are now able to ask these kinds of questions because they know that whatever we find, and of course we're finding huge inequities, like no surprise there, right? We're finding huge inequities. But we are sharing that information in a very careful and constructive manner 
for starting off always first acknowledging the massive constraints that they're facing, and but, uh, but talking about what we can and must do as a society to help our school district partners address these inequities. So you see how it's done in a very constructive manner, even though the results are, of course, disappointing. Um, I want to share very briefly with a few minutes that I have left, um, just to walk you through what uh, we have developed as a joint theory of action whenever we start a new research project. So the, the key word here is joint. This is not a theory of action that is developed by us as researchers working independently, but rather it's co-developed with our community partners, beginning first by asking the question, what is the core problem? What is the current state of affairs? What exactly is going on that, that needs to be addressed? So just to give you an, an example, um, uh, one project that we're working on right now um, with our school district partners is they said, we are noticing a rise in student needs, their health needs, their mental health needs especially, even basic needs like food and shelter and so forth, needs having to do with their home learning environment, having access to devices, having access to the internet, et cetera, and, and enrichment activities. They, they need to, to have opportunities for enrichment activities. So our school district partner said, we're noticing these needs. Can you help us document these needs so that we can address them in a meaningful way? So that was asking that first question. What is the core problem that we uh, identified together? Then we skip all the way to the desired ends. We don't quite go in chronological order. We start with a problem, and then what's the goal? And let's state it from the beginning, before we have any research findings in front of us, because sometimes that can lead us to, in other directions, but from the beginning, what's the desired goal? What are we trying to accomplish here? Because this is, this is the part we're talking about. This is about how do we create a more just society? How are we working toward justice in, in, in asking these questions, and, 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 and how do we get to those desired goals? Then we go back and ask, OK, what are the constraints? What are the key obstacles that we are facing, whether it's our district partners that are facing? What are the key obstacles that we as a society are facing that are preventing us from reaching these desired ends? And then, of course, what are the assets that we have available? Um, and not just the assets like here at Rice or the assets that our district partners may have, but what are the assets available in our broader community that can help us reach these desired ends? Then we ask, what are the specific strategies? So all this, <laughs> let me emphasize, all of these conversations happen before the start of a research project, not after. And I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but I want to emphasize it because I was trained, oh, the implications of research, that's what you do at the end of a study, and it's like, I, honestly, it's like an afterthought. So of course nobody's going to use the research. It's not going to matter unless you actually plan for it before the research study begins and you put a lot of effort into it, and it's a joint, joint effort. So just to give you an example, um, in this study about the, the concern that our district partners raised about rising student needs, um, we surveyed 45,000 students in Houston um, asking them about their needs. This was in uh, uh, 2020 and 2021. No, sorry, 2021 and 2022. And we surveyed the students about their needs, and, and then we shared this information with our school district uh, partners. Uh, so, exa for example, sh showing you here um, HISD high schools with the greatest needs. So we were able to share with them, for example, these are the student health needs, these are the percentages of students reporting difficulty accessing medical services. This is, again, 2021, 2022. Um, and you can see very clearly, I mean, there are some high schools that uh, had you know, more than a third to almost half of their students saying that they have trouble accessing medical services. That's huge. So not only are we documenting what kinds of needs, where those needs are, and the extent of those needs. We did the same thing for mental health needs. These are the percentages of students reporting difficulty accessing mental health services, basic needs, 
These are uh, things like having trouble um, not having enough food at home, um, not I mean, having um, unstable housing situations, or families having trouble uh, paying their rent or mortgage, um, families having trouble paying their utilities, and so on. Home learning needs and um, enrichment activity needs. So we shared all of this information um, with our school district partners. And uh, lastly, in our theory of action, our joint theory of action, we then go through milestones. Okay, so how will we gauge progress? How will we know that we're getting closer toward meeting our goal, our desired ends, which in this case is reducing student needs, like meeting their needs, and, and hopefully in future surveys, we'll be able to document a decline in student needs. So I'm happy to uh, report, and I'll end here, um, to report that next month um, we're having a, uh, an event that will be hosted by the Houston Food Bank and, um, and with our district partners and um, many service providers will be there, funders will be there, and notice this is fundraising not for our research but for our partners to be able to meet the needs of their students, the needs that we identified through our research. Um, so this is the kind of work that I have to say, I'll end with this, it's much harder to do research this way. I just, I just talked about all the stuff that we do before we even start the research, and, that's, and then of course doing the research is also difficult. But I have to say it is absolutely worth it. I have not found anything more rewarding than doing research in this way and actually seeing the impact that it has. I've seen policies change. I've seen uh, fundraising take place for, for the purposes of meeting these needs. I've seen lives change. I've seen even systems change, which is very, very hard to do. Systems change in order to actually make things more just, in this case, for our students locally. And that is way more rewarding than another publication. Thank you. I thought I was done. There are questions. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, is this model only applied to the field of sociology or does it apply to other fields? It absolutely applies to many other fields. So obviously I focus on sociology because I'm a sociologist. But um, I'm glad you asked that because uh, I recently, as of this summer, became the director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. So now I'm overseeing research in many other areas beyond my own expertise. So it's not just education research now, but also housing. In fact, I have a slide. There it is. Um, housing and transportation, economic mobility, community health, and population research. So I'm overseeing research in all of these areas within the Kinder Institute. Fortunately, I'm surrounded by a great team of people who do have expertise in these other areas. But it, yeah, it definitely applies to others. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll emphasize is that what we're doing now is that we're, we're making sure that we're doing more intersectional research because obviously all the problems that I was just talking about in education are not just about education, right? They're connected to all these other things. Um, so we're, we're trying to change the research model not only to focus on partnerships but also to focus on this inter intersectionality. Moshe. Can you put back the slide about theory of what you call theory of action? About? Yeah, this one, yeah, yeah. Oh. So I, I'm, I'm really struck by it because I don't know many people know, but I'm a, I'm a combat veteran. This is how you do military planning. Is that right? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, you say desire the end, you know, <laughs> defeat, defeat Germany. I don't know how I feel about this, but go on. <laughs> no, I, it's exactly how you go about it. You, you know where you are, you know what is desire end, and that's how you, you proceed to do military planning. This is classical <laughs> military planning. Wow, well thank you for sharing that. No, I really didn't know that. I, have not, I don't have any military experience myself. It's a good, it's a good thing. That's a, yeah, I think, I think so too. <laughs> 
Uh, Diana, Diana has a. Thank you. I is this working? Oops. What did I do? It's okay. Okay. It's so high. Okay. Thank you. It's on. The green light's on. Thank you. Um, I I wanted well, to say I loved your presentation, um, and as a scholar who has challenged the modus operandi in my own uh, academic discipline, I appreciated the challenges that you um, uh, s set forth. Um, actually, I would say it's probably worse in econ than in sociology, but we could debate that. <laughs> um, um, I, I do want to say, though, that, um, that one of the things that I found uh, when I was searching for alternative approaches, um, I, did, I did get inspiration from scholars whom I found um, who were at um, the pinnacle of power in the discipline who, who were doing research that I, I found inspirational, that actually was oriented towards human well-being. And I, I want to just um, give a shout out to Amartya Sen, who was in fact a Nobel Prize winner in economics, who, who looked at um, famine. And you know, I mean, he was the person who basically said the problem wasn't there's not enough food, but that the prices were too high. Right. And I don't think this is a case where talking to the people who were starving would have led to the right answer. And same when he, with his research on missing women, which has been an inspiration to feminist economists, where he did this very careful research showing that um, this was in 1990, that there were 100 million women who were dead who might otherwise have been alive had they had um, comparable access to the basic resources needed for survival. And, and what both of these studies showed was that economists were looking at the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. And it didn't necessarily help um, you know, or change what the people in power were doing. But it, it did um, provide inspiration for a groundswell of movement towards other people. You know, and right now, also, um, in economics, there's a growing movement looking at you know, the um, kind of lack of attention to race, and especially in, econ in economics. Um, so I, I guess I would say that um, one has to be cautious about generalizing because mm -hmm. there are these different pockets of, um, of movement um, and that maybe what is the most challenging is the ways in which disciplinary hierarchies can make it harder for people who want to do research that is oriented towards improving human lives, mm -hmm. go about the business of doing what they want to do and getting recognition for that. That's uh, exactly right. I, I, so. I appreciate your comment, uh, Diana, about how this is, this, so this partnership model that I presented, that I think I said, but maybe I, I, I went through it very quickly, um, it's not, I don't think this is the answer Right? And, and not necessarily the answer for every field. Um, but this is, this is something that has worked quite well in, in the social sciences and sociology in particular. But um, I will say that you, uh, hopefully the, what, be, what, um, what was clear here is the underlying principle, which is that um, that end, and I think you captured it at the, at the tail end of what you said, that the end goal here is not academic publications, it's not um, citations, it's not the usual metrics, the things that we as academics are taught to value. There is no intrinsic value in any of those things. And we need to be very careful about how we're training our graduate students as well, because they get so hung up on these things that are not inherently valuable, in my opinion, okay, so you may disagree with me on this, but I don't think that's the ultimate goal of research. That instead, like when I interview students or potential job candidates, I mean, it's nails on the chalkboard when I ask them why they want, what, what are their goals, you know, what do they want to do, and they tell me, oh, my goal is to get a PhD, get an academic job, and publish, and I'm like, boring. You know, and is that really what you value? Like, those are a means to an end, but they should never be seen as an end in and of itself. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we train um, people to think that, and that's, I think, wrong. 